Hey guys, Killstokes here. Welcome back to the Trading Coach Podcast. Today we're going to talk about airplane theory and how it is directly related to you losing or keeping your money and probably your sanity, your mental health, and everything that goes along with that as well. But before we hop into it, I want to say a big thank you. We had the Trading Coach Podcast episode 1,000, a little episodes ago, and just want to say thank you to everyone that has supported the podcast up to this point. Be getting messages all over the place about how they're finding me all over the internet as one of the top-rated trading and Forex podcasts out there. So I did my research, right, and tried to find like a legit site, and I couldn't find one that didn't require me to pay for a quote-unquote official ranking, and I don't care that much to know, but I did see that where uh, there are over 500 reviews for the Trading Coach podcast, and the average star amount is 4.9. So whoever brought that rating down, I'm going to find you, and I'm going to make you pay. Um, But I would have to pay for the service to find that out, so I'm I'm not going to do it. Anyway, let's hop into the show. So, Airplane theory, right? What is it? Uh, If you do a quick Google search, you're going to find lots of things about wings and and air and and actual flight patterns. Um, We're not talking that. We are talking airplane theory in a different sense, right? This uh, theory, I guess, or me learning about this theory came from a speech I was listening to from a former collegiate basketball player, a great college basketball player, as well as a great NBA player named Jalen Rose. And he was explaining what airplane theory meant to him. And he he had this thought while he was on a plane. He said he was sitting on a plane. He had his grandmother on the plane who's like 90 years old. He had his young child on the plane who I don't know how young she was, but, you know, young enough. And they were going through the, the regular process that you go through on an airplane, right? You've never been on an airplane. You, you sit down, the, um, the what, what are they called? The, the flight attendant, they come out and they do the whole safety speech where it's like, here are the exits, here's this, here's that. And the one thing that they always say is that like, you know, if the, the plane gets into trouble or massive turbulence or God forbid you're going down, oxygen mask will drop from the head area above. And here's the important part you must secure your own oxygen mask before securing the mask of others. And he, this made him hesitate a little bit. He said, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait a minute. I've got a 90 year old grandma here. I've got a young child here. My first instinct is to protect the elderly, protect the children first. And I think that's many of our first instincts. I'm I'm forced enough to never have been in that situation. But I also think that the first thing I would do is try to save my wife, try to save my grandma, try to save my kid, right? You you secure them first, selflessness, right? And then you worry about yourself later. So he got pretty upset. He's like, well, why is this a thing? This is is backwards. This is kind of selfish. And I think someone explained it to him where it was, well, the reason they do that is because, well, If something happens and you pass out first, you're unable to help the people you want to help in the first place. However, if you do secure yours first, now because you have the air and whatever going into you, stopping you from passing out, now you're able to help the ones that you care about. So it's kind of a, if you help yourself first, you can then help others. And he went on to talk about this in different aspects of life. And the three aspects that I want to touch on today are going to be financial freedom, so personal finance, um, kind of the trading, and and two on the trading journey, right? So let's talk about financial freedom first and foremost, right? One of the biggest things I see, and and, and this happened to me as well, is that sometimes, you know, people who like to help, natural helpers, right? Some people are selfish, but some people are overly unselfish and like to help others, and it it, it hurts themselves in, in the process. And One of the things that we see a lot is that people who are in okay situations try to help out people who are in bad situations, right? So don't get me wrong. I'm I'm someone that believes in in giving the charity, but this would be the equivalent of like, let's say you had a paycheck of $1,000 and you gave $900 to charity. Well, that's great that you're helping charity, but you're also kind of 
what is it, cutting your something off to save your foot? I don't know the, the saying. Type it below in the comment section so I can learn and be better next time. But you kind of, you, you're cutting your nose off to spite your face. One of those things. I don't know. But it's a situation like that. Um, you see this with a lot of professional athletes where a lot of people go pro. And, and for you guys that didn't know, so many professional athletes go broke. And the reason that they go broke is because as soon as they make it pro, right, they are like the golden goose of their family, their community, their their friend circle, right? And as soon as they go pro, because they are the ones that made it, they feel the responsibility to help out everyone else that helped them on the way there. So buying family members' houses, you know, uncles and aunts and cousins reach out out of nowhere. Your your friends that were there supporting you from day one, right? You got to take care of them. So you're hooking them up with jobs. You're paying people to do this. You're buying houses. And before you know it, your paycheck is gone. Not to mention what goes to taxes and your agent and all that fun stuff. Your paycheck is gone. And because professional, af uh, professional athletics have such a short window, you don't have enough time to kind of recoup all that back and you don't find yourself in a good situation. I had something very similar to myself where I was never a professional athlete, didn't make professional athlete money, but I was one of the first out of my friends to kind of quote unquote make it, right? And I felt this obligation. We had this agreement like, hey, one of us is going to make it out. Whichever one of us makes it, we're going to bring the others along and help us out. So when I first started seeing success in trading, and I, I wasn't making enough money to like be financially free or anything like that. I was just making enough money to kind of survive and live a, a, a comfortable life, right? I, I had a, a rental property that I owned, so I didn't have to pay any rent there, just bills and whatnot. Um, I, didn't, I don't really buy a lot of stuff. I'm a very frugal person. So, you know, bills were paid. I can, I, I can no longer, you know, I no, I no longer had to only eat like ramen and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, cheese sandwiches. I, it was good. And I started doing stuff like giving back to my friends where whenever we would go out to eat, I would pay for the bill. Or whenever we would go out to the bar, I would buy drinks for everyone. And little small stuff like that, I'd help someone out with like a car loan or something like that. Little small stuff like that added up because what it was doing, and this is in hindsight with all the knowledge I have now is, when it comes to the path of being financially free, if I would have saved that money, and this is like an every week type of thing, right? If I would have saved that money, and if I would have either A, invested it back in my trading account or invested it in the financial markets or invested it in another real estate property or done anything with it so that that money can grow, I would have reached my financial freedom goals a lot earlier than I did. And not to get too consumed over this, but I'd probably be like five years ahead because once that stuff starts compounding, right, um, it, it grows at a rapid rate. And that's one of my biggest regrets. It's, it's a learning opportunity and it allows me to create awesome podcast episodes for you guys like this, but that's one of my biggest regrets. So at the time, I was trying to protect others and help others but at the same time, I was cutting my own toes off and, and inhibiting my ability to run at the pace I wanted to run as far as that race to financial freedom goes. We had this situation as well for a trader I recently spoke to, and I said this in a, a recent podcast too, where he was a trader. He had finally made it. When I, when I mean made it, he was uh, finding periods of consistent profitability. I say periods because you know how it is. In the, the new trader stage, you go through this, this stage where you're consistently bad, and then you kind of you get good, and then you're, 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 you're still making some dumb mistakes every now and then, but you're, there's more good than bad, and you kind of feel like you're, you're very close to the, 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 the top of that mountain. And he started going backwards. And the reason he started going backwards is because he had made it, so of course, all of his friends are reaching out to him about, hey, what did you do? Can you help me? And he's like, yeah, I'm gonna give back. I, you know, I found the secret to success, the holy grail of trading, and now I'm gonna share it with you guys. The problem is, right, his friends didn't wanna hear it. His friends didn't wanna hear that the holy grail of trading is risk management and trading psychology and, and treating your trading like a business, right? They didn't wanna hear any of that stuff. They want to hear strategy and entries and shiny stuff, right? So he's having these daily battles with these friends of kind of, you know, resetting them, getting them off the right track. It's kind of like, a, you know, uh, when my kids were young, it's like, you know, when my kids first learned how to walk, it was amazing. I love or crawl. It was amazing. I loved it. Right. They, were, they finally weren't boring. Right. They, they sit there and do nothing and you know, roll a little bit and whatever. Get stuck. They start crawling. Now it's like life's an adventure. Let's see what life has to offer. But then the bad thing is they start crawling to dangerous things. Like they're crawling up on the shelf and like close to grabbing a knife. And if you ever had a kid, uh, maybe pets are the same way, 
right? You see this kid crawling, he's trying to get something dangerous, so you reroute him, right? You stop what you're doing, you stop recording the podcast, you go pick him up, you carry him back to where you started with, you say, hey, don't touch that, stay there, blah, 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 blah. And then what happens two seconds after you turn away? Two seconds. What happens? They start crawling back in the same direction. And then you got to go reroute them again. And they keep doing this over and over again before you know it, you get no work done. This is what was happening to this trader. He kept rerouting his friends so much that he lost the ability to focus on his own trading and he started seeing his results drop because of like these weird mistakes. I see that in my own trading right now. I, I tell you guys, um, and it's no offense, I would be a much better trader at this phase if I weren't coaching. Coaching has hindered my ability to become better. Now, it's helped me as well in different ways. It reinforces a lot of things. So I'm, I'm definitely not worse and I, and I am getting better. But as far as like continued education, refining my strategies, working on something new, I don't have a lot of time to do that. If I didn't coach, I would be spending all my free time developing strategies and, and finding more efficient ways to trade the markets or getting back into the stock market at a much smarter rate, right? I, I've been dipping and dabbing a little bit lately, but I really want to get back in. I just don't have the energy to do it because the, the energy is spent helping other traders. Now, that is an agreement that I made with myself. This is also the reason that, you know, many of you guys may not know this. I, I was supposed to start trading like two years or coaching, excuse me, two years before I did, but I declined. And one of the reasons I declined, I told my mentor, I said, hey, I'm not ready, man. Like I need to fully focus on myself and get myself 100% set, right? And prove it to myself, which I grade myself on an annual basis. Like it takes me a year. To, if I don't do something for a year, it's not proof before I can coach. So I told him no two years in a row because I wasn't ready. And, and once I was ready, um, I'm glad I did it, but I, I was smart enough to take that time. But if you're spending too much energy on others, you're gonna have less energy for yourself and there are gonna be um, negatives to that. The last one is specifically in trading, right? We talked a little bit about my inability to develop strategies and stuff like that. Um, this is something I call, and I just made this up right now, the first things first theory. By my course, first things first theory, right? And this is a method that I always tell traders who are working through the process because we, we, we spoke about the perfectionist the other day. It's great to have goals, it's great to have dreams, it's great to have desires, but there are so many traders out there that they create this big picture and they feel like they can't get started until they have the big picture fully completed. So let, let, let's, for example, bigger picture, Akil, I want to trade advanced pattern formations, which is a pretty systematic consolidation, pretty much type of strategy. I want to trade pullbacks, trend continuation trade, so get involved with the trend, and, uh, and I want to trade counter trade um, setup. So um, when the market runs into support and resistance, the end of the trend, periods of relief. I want to trade three ways, and I want to trade three ways on 10 pairs a piece, right? So that's 30 combinations, right? 10 times three of trend continuation, 10 times three of advanced pattern formations, 10 times three of counter trend. So let's say that it takes you, this is gonna be a whole opportunity cost thing. Let's say it takes you a year, right? Let's, not, so let's say six months, right? You're getting busy, right? Let's say it takes you six months to finish back testing, refining your strategy before and, and on all those pairs before you can trade it, right? So it's gonna take you, and, and this is like after you go through the whole process of learning how to trade and all that fun stuff and not counting the awkward like demo trading period where you're still making mistakes, right? But just like being able to trade live. What you've done is you've you've taken, what I say, six months for strategy one on all those pairs. It's probably gonna take more than six months, but let's say six months on strategy one, six months on strategy two, six months on strategy three. So it's taken you 18 months, a year and a half, right? to finally get to the point where you can trade live. Well, let me ask you this. And, and, and again, a year and a half isn't a big deal in the bigger picture. It usually takes traders, traders the whole learning process, right? Six to 18 months, right? So that's 18 months is normal, but that's not counting the learning process, right? This is just the back testing process. But what if you were just to do this, right? In the most basic form, what if you were just to, I mean, let's not even go to the most basic, let's just simplify. What if you were just to learn one strategy? advanced pattern formations, right? Let's say you were, you were gonna learn one advanced pattern formation, test it on, what I say, 10 pairs. Well, you would be live trading in six months, right? 
So you've got basically a year of live trading and making money that you didn't have before. Remember what I told you earlier about how I kind of tripped over my own feet helping others and, 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 and delaying my, my path to financial freedom? A year now doesn't seem like much, but as that money starts to grow and compound and accelerate at a massive rate, five years from now, you're like, man, I could have been five years ahead. And then you can take it to another route where you start trading even, even closer. So like, for example, here, here's how I started trading, right? I chose one advanced pattern formation and I started on one pair. My, my mentor had this saying, one strategy, one pair, one time frame. And I took that to heart. So I started trading one advanced pattern formation on a single pair, on a single time frame. And then while I was trading that, making money, right? And, and, and losing money some, because I, I wasn't as disciplined as I should be, but that's, that's for another story. Um, then I started doing the other things in the background, right? So put yourself in position where you take care of yourself first, right? Put yourself in a stable position before you reach back and try to help others or add more things to your arsenal. This is, again, advice I wish I knew when I was younger, but I don't believe in regrets. It is now advice that I can give you and hopefully you don't make the same mistakes that I did. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. Hey, leave me a rating and a review. I told you I have an average of 4.9 stars, which is still bothering me. So give me five stars so we can inch closer and closer and closer to making that average five. I know we can't quite get there, but we can get as close as possible. But seriously, it's a big help for us growing the show. I appreciate your support as always. And until next time, plan your trade, trade your plan. Take care.